read Ephesians chapter 6, just one verse, verse 15. Ephesians 6, 15. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. It's the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Amen. Our Father and our God, as we look at this one short verse that's in the middle of your armor, that you are preparing us to do battle against the world, to do battle against sin, to do battle for the gospel, proclaiming the gospel. As we read in verses 10 through 13, the schemes of the devil, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, cosmic powers, the present darkness, spiritual forces of evil. Let us remember again to take up all the armor you've given us, that you've equipped us with, whereby we can be soldiers for you, proclaiming the gospel unto all peoples. In your name we pray. Amen. There's something different about life when you have your shoes on. <laughs> Wendy's been following this, I think she's an artist, blogger, or a Instagram or someone, she's been following someone on the internet that um, talks about when the first thing she does when she gets up in the morning is she puts her shoes on. And when you do that, it makes you ready for the day. It's just You're just ready to just get out and go. I had a good friend named Jim. He used to help me in my sign business. He was about 15 years older than I was. He's since passed away. And he he just was always on the go. He was ready to go. We'd go install a sign. He would be running back and forth from the truck to do the install. He said when he was a little boy, he'd gotten a new pair of shoes, his first pair of dress shoes. He's probably five years old. You know, the Sunday go to meet in dress shoes, Buster Browns. And he's in bed one night, and his mom is like, Jim, what are you doing? He's like, nothing. I said, where are your new shoes? He said, I'm wearing them. <laughs> And she pulls back the covers, and there he is with his new shoes on and his pajamas. He's just ready to go. And that just encapsulated his personality. Had his shoes on, ready to go. How can this thought help us this week as we continue to put on the armor of Christ? The last time we looked at this, we looked at the breastplate of righteousness to protect us as we go into battle for mortal wounds, to encourage us that we are safely in Christ. We remember that Christ wore this breastplate of righteousness in battle against Satan himself. In the time before that, we talked about the belt of truth, having that foundation of God's truth in our life. But now we're moving from foundational armor to armor that's absolutely indispensable. You can't fight without it. Can you imagine going into battle without your shoes on? How far would you get? I mean, you wouldn't get past the tent. We must have shoes for the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shoes for the preparation of the gospel of peace. We are given shoes that we are to use as we proclaim the gospel. The gospel which is preparing people to be converted, to receive God's peace by God's sovereign, saving work. And we, as we march forward into battle, we go in God's peace to preach the peace of the gospel. And Christ wants us prepared for battle. All of our armor on, both shoes on. When I was a younger man and scouting and as a teenager, and then for actually the last six, 10 years after that, uh, I did a lot of hiking, both in the south and in the White Mountains here. And you've really got to have good boots. And the thing I hated was buying new boots. I remember my first pair of boots. I was just, just graduated high school, had a little bit of money, and bought a pair of boots that were Italian-made. They cost about a week's worth of wages. I was really excited because we were doing a lot of hiking, my best friend and I. And... I was so excited, except the salesman wasn't very good and they didn't fit quite right. And they were the most uncomfortable boots 
that I ever had. I mean, I kept them for maybe a year and then just had to chuck them and get a new pair. Boots are essential for an army. And the Roman army knew this. They had evolved over time. They'd started with sandals, then they went to shoes, and eventually they had what we would say is a boot. But they weren't only used for fighting. Because where does a soldier spend most of his time? Where does a soldier spend most of their time, Rick? Off duty. Off duty, yeah. You're in the barracks, you're training. Your fighting time is, could be very, very small. But you're still in those boots all the time. You're marching. You're on maneuvers. You're training. You're in the barracks. You're in the garrison. It's essential, though, that we have them. Our Savior was equipped with such boots. For his earthly ministry, the shoes he wore as he proclaimed the gospel of peace. And Paul isn't using this metaphor, stealing it from the Roman army, as we saw in the other pieces of armor. But he's talking about Christ himself. And we are fighting for Christ as we fight to proclaim the gospel throughout the world. Paul's actually looking back to Isaiah 52, what we started with this morning. We read the first six verses. But specifically, look at verses 7 through 11 if you'd like to turn there. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord of Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. The warrior proclaiming the gospel. The warrior not fighting for his country, not fighting for glory, not fighting for conquests, but to bring peace, the peace of God's gospel into the people's hearts. Christ came bringing peace. And we are to wear the shoes given us to proclaim this peace. Isaiah 52, 7 has a key word, though. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Peace comes from the mountains, and that means our marching days are going to be hard. You hike through the mountains, it's not easy. You walk through, I, I was on the coast of Maine this week, and Wendy and I went walking every day. There were lots of nature trails, two, three miles long, but it's fairly flat. We're right at sea level, maybe 100 feet elevation. But you go up to the White Mountains, it's up, down, up, down, nonstop. It's hard hiking, hot or dusty, filled with the breeze, rocks, tree roots, and as, but as the Romans refined their footwear for their battles based upon their needs, our Savior has equipped us with similar footwear, tailor-made shoes that he himself has proved. And with our holy shoes, our new shoes, comes our holy commission. The passage states, as, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel, of peace. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, we are giving shoes so that we may be God's heralds, proclaiming his peace, proclaiming his salvation to the nations. This also fits with Isaiah's other metaphor, that of the watchman in Isaiah 52 1 Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. And in verse 8, the voice of the watchman, they lift up their voice. They sing for joy for all to see. <coughs> we are to be God's modern-day heralds. 
we don't have watchmen in the traditional sense that they had hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, but we are still the watchmen that God has proclaimed to proclaim his goodness. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, the prophet Joel says in chapter 2. And he goes on to say, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Or as Paul writes in the Romans chapter 10, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then Will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him from whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. We are to be about the business of proclaiming the gospel joyfully, as Joel says, as Paul says in Romans. That passage in Joel, by the way, was used by Peter in his sermon on Pentecost when 3,000 came to the faith that day. We are to do this joyfully. joyfully. We are to do this triumphantly. So we speak for God. When you proclaim Christ, you were speaking for him directly. You're not trying to sell them Chick-fil-A. That's going to offend some of us here, isn't it? <laughs> I love Chick-fil-A. We don't speak for Apple Computer. We don't speak for Beretta Firearms. I used to sell Beretta, love the product, love Apple Computers, good stuff. But we speak for God. Second Corinthians 2 says, if we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word, we're not peddlers, we're not salesmen. We are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. We do not only speak for Christ, we speak in his name, in his power. <clears throat> and as such, we have a holy commission. And because of this, we must get the message right and we must get the message out. We must get the message right, the gospel. We must get the message out, the gospel. Getting the message of the gospel right, putting your shoes on. It's actually funny, as I was preparing this message, unbeknownst to me, a friend of mine didn't know I was preparing this message. He calls me out of the blue and he says, would you tell me what the gospel is? Now, he's a strong believer. He just said, just tell me how to articulate the gospel. I think we should all know that. How should we answer? Let me give you just a few thoughts here. I would start with God is sovereign. God is in control. Or as Isaiah put it in Isaiah 52, 7, your God reigns. Nothing is beyond him. God is in control, not Satan, not the politicians. God has made all things and control all things. He works all things for his glory, including our salvation. And with that, I would go back to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. But what did we do in the garden? We made ourselves other gods. We denied God. And we fell from God's grace into sin. And we continue to make idols in our own hearts and lives. 
we must be iconoclast. We must be breaking down our idols in our lives and in our ministry. What are your idols? What are the idols of your life? Now, we don't live in a culture where we take a block of wood and carve it or a piece of metal and cast it into an image and bow down before it. But what are the idols of our heart? What are the idols of our mind? Where do we put our strength and our effort into? Why are they there? Why do we have idols in our lives? I think it's because of remaining sin in our lives. That vestiges of sin still wants to have control, still doesn't really trust Christ with the gospel in parts of our lives. We need to say, I can just do this on my own. I want to take control somehow. What will it take to break down your idols? It takes the gospel. It takes the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves us from our idols. We must think about this daily in our lives. We must use the, the gospel daily in our sanctification. We've probably looked at this verse dozens of times already. Philippians 2, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only my presence, but much more my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Daily breaking down those idols. That's what he means by working out your salvation. But the good news of the gospel is God is the one giving you the will to do it, the desire to do it. He's the one who's going to make it so that you can accomplish this through Christ. And using the means of grace that God has given us. The means of grace meaning those tools that God has given us to serve Him and to grow in grace. The Word of God, prayer, and the church. And we must also realize that God's idols do not reign. They have no power over us. Romans 8 tells us, Thou, There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, cannot do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, He condemned flesh, sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, Christ has come and conquered sin and conquered the devil. In the life that now we now live, we can live through God's power serving Him. God has redeemed us through Christ. And with that, he grants us his peace. As Isaiah said, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. And God always is redeeming about his, pe his people. That's the business that he's about, redeeming his people. We looked in Ephesians chapter 1 last year, verses 4 and 5. Even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. <clears throat> in love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will. God choosing us, redeeming us, setting us apart. Whereas Christ Himself said it in the Gospels, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. When Christ calls a person, they come to him. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. This is incredible grace given to us. Isaiah proclaimed judgment is due for the nation's sins. Yet God shows his mercy. As we read this morning at the opening of the service, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall become like wool. Remembering that it's God himself 
granting true repentance to us. In Romans we read, Do you presume on the riches and kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And God himself giving us faith and belief, as we read in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. God giving us repentance, God giving us faith and belief, and God giving us his peace. Isaiah 53, but he that is looking forward to Christ, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And those that were once cursed are now called blessed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God wants his redemption to be known by his people, and God wants his redemption proclaimed to all people. Isaiah said in 52.10, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. A word picture there of the strong man bearing his arm, showing his muscles, showing that he is redeeming his people to all the ends of the earth. It's an interesting passage Isaiah also talks about in Isaiah chapter 19. passage, I think it's easy to read over and not catch the full meaning, but in Isaiah 19, it says, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth whom the Lord of hosts is blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Why is that significant? Think of the geography of the area. and Think of those three nations, Israel, Egypt, and Assyria. Israel, called to be God's people, called to set apart, called to proclaim the gospel. Egypt, a country that they had been in bondage to, and Assyria, a nation they would later be in bondage to. Oppressors, evil countries. But Egypt and Assyria will worship together along with Israel. And the interesting thing is, if you look at a map, you put Israel in the middle. Well, you should do it the other way. To the south and west, is the south and east is Egypt and to the north and west is Assyria. So to get from Assyria to Egypt, you have to go through Israel. It's the bridge between the two. God's using another word picture, a metaphor, that to reach Israel, uh, to reach Assyria from Egypt or vice versa, you have to go through Israel. You have to go through the gospel. You have to go through Christ. And God will do this and has been doing this for centuries as the gospel has been proclaimed throughout the world. The kingdom of God proclaimed to God's enemies. We read about that in Romans 5, 9 through 11. Well, while we were enemies, what did God do? He sent Christ to the cross for us through the heralding, through the proclamation of the gospel. Israel was to do this, but it failed. So God sent his son, and he's now sending us. Getting the message of the gospel right, getting the message of the gospel out, putting on your shoes, getting the message of the gospel right, getting the message of the gospel out, putting your shoes on to proclaim the gospel. Now the Bible says the gospel is to be proclaimed to all peoples, showing his mercy. We just read about it saying that it'd be to Assyria and to Egypt. 
What would that look like if he was writing this today? Probably to North Korea or the radical Islamist or to that political party that you know is all wrong. Those people always do crooked stuff. They do anything to get elected. They're trying to kill our country. Or to our cranky neighbor or our co-worker who ratted on us or to even our grandchildren and our children who have not proclaimed the gospel, professed the gospel. It is to be to all people. The gospel must go out. God's message has always been proclaimed through his heralds, through Isaiah, Jeremiah, David, Moses. They proclaim the Redeemer is coming. John the Baptist said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Peter at Pentecost, Paul as he traveled across the empire, planting churches to the ends of the earth, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus and his salvation. And then we have Christ himself, the true evangelist, the true herald of God's salvation. Israel failed to proclaim God's salvation, so God sent his son. What did Jesus come for? He came not only to save sinners, Jews and Gentiles, but proclaim his kingdom of redemption to all people. What was the main emphasis of Christ when he came? If you look at the media or look at the movies that have been made about him, it's lots of emphasis on his healing ministry, his compassion, feeding the sick, or healing the sick, feeding the hungry. And he did many signs and miracles, but it was evangelism, his proclamation of the good news of the gospel. It's why he came. Just a cursory look at the book of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Showing us, as God said, these were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In, in his name. Jesus not only heralded the truth, but backed it up with his life by living a holy and a righteous life. Are we living lives that back up what we proclaim for the gospel? Are we living a life like Christ, a life that proclaims the gospel in our words and our deeds? And Christ dying for his people, would we be willing to lay down our lives, thinking about our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, what they're going through now? When I was much younger, I have a really good friend of mine, Jay Lu, who's from Romania. I probably mentioned him before. He's my age. Um, he grew up in communist Romania. And he's been a believer since he was a small child. He was raised in a Christian home. But much persecution, as you know, through Ceausescu after the, Romanian Revol after the Romanians regained power from the Nazis in the 40s. And Christianity was repressed mercilessly. Probably one of the most repress repressive governments in the world at that time. And J. Lou said at one point, he was pulled in by the secret police and they said, we know who you are. We know what you're doing. At the time, he was involved in student ministry in the, in the nation, underground. He said, we're coming for you eventually. We know who you are. We know what you're doing. We know where you live. and We're coming back for you. Fortunately for him, the revolution took place in 89. He was spared that. But many thousands were not. and paid dearly with their lives. We are to be heralds for Christ walking in our new shoes, commanded to be heralds for the salvation, to proclaim his salvation. Peter tells us to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. For the hope that is in you. Before we can proclaim that light, before we can proclaim that peace, we must have that peace of Christ, that light of Christ within us. We must be the first to hear and receive the salvation of God. We are all sinners. Christ is offering his forgiveness. 
We are all condemned in our sins, but Christ offers His peace and salvation. And when we lack peace in our lives, we must look and see, how did we take our eyes off of Christ? How are we embracing the idols of our hearts that draw us away from Him? Looking for that indwelling sin and asking for repentance. I love how the writer of Hebrews puts it when he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, looking to Christ, running with endurance. You've got to have shoes on to run, don't you? A lot better with shoes on. There's one last passage I want to look at is Isaiah chapter 6, where this famous passage where Isaiah sees the vision of the seraphim and the throne of God. And God is asking for a spokesman to go out and speak for him. And Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. But before that, what happened to Isaiah? You've read the story, you've read the, not the story, you've read the, the passage, it's a true, true vision, that one of the angels took a live coal and touched the lips of Isaiah. And that signifies he's purifying his mouth to speak for Christ. So before he could speak, he needed cleansing. And it was granted. He touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And then what happened? Isaiah got his gospel shoes fitted. He touched my mouth and said, This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin's atoned for. And I heard a voice saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, go and say to my people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Go and preach the gospel, even to those that try and reject you, that say they don't want you. Go and preach the gospel regardless. Will you put on your gospel shoes? Will you put on your shoes proclaiming God's peace? In the same way, so let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We are to proclaim God's peace and God's light. The word, Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Does God want you to light a light and hide it from others? No, don't hide your light from others. People around you are stumbling in the dark. Some are going to stumble headlong into an eternity of hell, of damnation and eternal torment. Think about a sister or a child or a co-worker or a best friend or a neighbor you like to hang around with. Are they going to hang around with you in eternity? Because right now their lives are hanging over the pit. Jonathan Edwards preached his famous Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God sermon using this verse. For the time when their foot shall slip, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and their doom comes swiftly. And he used the metaphor of a, somebody with their foot just standing one step away from eternity, ready to slide down into the pit of hell. And when we think about evangelism, we think... Honestly, if with myself, it's been this way a lot. It's very scary. It's intimidating. It's off-putting to people. How are you going to look to them? How do you come across? But brothers and sisters, we are proclaiming God's eternal peace to those around us. I know we have doubts. We're afraid. We ask ourselves, what's going to happen? Are they going to listen? What if I mess up the sales pitch? <laughs> but we're not peddlers, as Paul told the Corinthian church. We're proclaiming Christ. 
And we must remember our God reigns. Remember that God is sovereign. Our God is in control. He calls us. He saves us. He keeps us. He calls us in John 46, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I will raise him up at the last day. He saves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And he keeps us. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Well, if God's doing all this saving, all this proclaiming, all this sanctifying, what do we have to do? Why do we have to proclaim the gospel? Why do we need to do that? He just He's going to get it done. If you've heard of R.C. Sproul, he, uh, he was asked this question when he was in seminary. He had a professor named John Gerstner, and Dr. Gerstner was teaching about the sovereignty of God and the salvation of God and how God saves people and God calls people, and they will come to Christ. And he says, well, why do you guys need to be in the pastorate? And he had them lined up in a semicircle, and R.C. said he was on one end, and Dr. Gerstner started on this end. He said, boy, I'm so glad he didn't start with me. And he says, so seminarian, whatever your name is, tell me why we need to preach the gospel. And he's like, I don't know. And guys are kind of like, you know, hiding themselves, you know, trying, hopefully to get called on. He just works his way across. And uh, finally got to RC and nobody had answered the question. He says, well, Dr. Gerstner, this is going to sound, you know, kind of weak. Probably not the answer you're looking for, but we need to proclaim the gospel because... God commands it. And he gives his little diabolical laugh that he used to give. He says, that's exactly right, Mr. Sproul. We proclaim the gospel because God has commanded it. It is a command. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, Paul tells Timothy. Always be ready to give an answer to those who ask. But it's not only a command. It's a privilege to speak for Christ. You are a chosen race, Peter said, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, so that you may Do this. You are given this, not only command, but this great blessing of preaching the gospel. And remember, it's God is the one who changes the hearts. He does not grant to man that power. God is not holding his breath, waiting for us to evangelize, as he's determined already the means of a person's salvation. He determines ultimately how it comes to pass. And at the last judgment, No one's going to come to you and accuse you of being cast into eternal damnation because you didn't speak to them. We are each responsible for our own rejection of God. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son does not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. But we are to preach the gospel because we don't know how God is going about that business, if he's using you or not. We follow after Jesus, the true eternal herald who proclaimed, I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Why was Christ doing this? Over and over again. John 530, 6:38, 8:28, 12:49, 14:10, 14:24, he says, I have come to do my Father's will. I don't speak for myself. I speak for the Father. I obey the Father in all that I do. And as Christ obeyed the Father in proclaiming his peace and salvation, will you be faithful in that command to proclaim the gospel? Will you go in the assurance that it's not your words you are speaking, but God the Father's words proclaiming his love, his mercy, 
his peace, his redemption, his deliverance, doing your Father's will. We are to go into all the world in his power. In Christ, he will always be with us, as we read in Matthew. I am with you always to the end of the age. And his word will be heard by his people and not return void. So shall my word that goes forth from my mouth that shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose <coughs> and shall succeed in the thing for which I have sent it. Whereas Paul, or the writer of Luke, the writer of Acts said, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. What's evangelism really about? What is it really? It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find a crust of bread. It's one beggar telling another where to find some food. So put your shoes on. Walk out the door in God's shoes, ready to proclaim His peace to a world that is hungry. Our Father and our God, may we always be faithful to put our shoes on when we first get out of bed in the morning. Not just to do our earthly work, but to do your heavenly work as well with that privilege of sharing the gospel. Yes, it's a command. We must be faithful to it, but it's also a joy and a privilege to serve you and speak for you the words of peace that come with the gospel. First, in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.